Prayer and Praying Men, Chapter 6, being read by, P by Peter John Parises, also known as Brian Dean. Chapter 6, Hezekiah and the Praying King. The great religious reformation under King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah was thoroughly impregnated with prayer in its various stages. King Hezekiah of Judah will serve as an illustration of a praying elder of God's church, white-robed and gold-crowned. He had genius and strength, wisdom and piety. He was a statesman, a general, a poet, and a religious reformer. He is a distinct surprise to us, not so much because of his strength and genius, they were to be expected, but in his piety, under all the circumstances connected with him. The rare statement, quote, He did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, unquote, is a glad and thrilling surprise when we consider all his history and, and his environments. Where did he come from? Under what circumstances was his childhood life spent? Who were his parents, and what was their religious character? Worldliness, half-heartedness, and utter apostasy marked the reign of his father, grandfather, and his great-grandfather. His home surroundings, as he grew up, were far from being favorable to godliness and faith in God. One thing, however, favored him. He was fortunate in having Isaiah for his friend and counselor when he assumed the crown of Judah. How much good there is in a ruler's having a God-fearing man for a counselor and an associate. With what familiar and successful praying did he intercede with God is seen in the Passover feast, in which a number of the people were unfitted to participate. They had not prepared themselves by the required ceremonial cleansing, and it was important that they be allowed to eat the Passover feast with all the others. Here is the brief account with special reference to the praying of Hezekiah and the result. Quote, For there are many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passover for every one that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people had not cleansed themselves, yet they did eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. Unquote. So the Lord heard him as he prayed, and even the violation of the most sacred law of the Passover was forgiven in answer to the prayer of this praying, God fearing king. Law must yield its scepter to prayer. The strength, directness, and foundation of his faith and prayer are found in his words to his army. Memorable words are they, stronger and mightier than all the host of Sentinel Cherubim. S-E-N-N-A-N-A-C-H-E-R-I-B. Quote, Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed, for the king of Assyria, nor for his multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an army of flesh, but with us is the Lord of God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Unquote. His defense against the mighty enemies of God was prayer. His enemies quailed and were destroyed by his prayers when his own armies were powerless. God's people were always safe when their princes were princes in prayer. An occasion of serious import came to the people of God during his reign, which was to test his faith in God and furnish opportunity to try the prayer agency to obtain deliverance. Judah was sorely pressed by the Assyrians, and humanly speaking, defeated, and captivity seemed imminent. The king of Assyria sent a commission to defy and blaspheme the name of God and to insult King Hezekiah, and they uttered their insults and blaspheme publicly. Note what Hezekiah immediately did, without hesitation. Quote, and it came to pass, when Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Unquote. His very first impression was to turn to God by going to the, quote, house of prayer, unquote. God was in his thoughts, and prayer was the first thing to be done. And so he sent messengers to Isaiah to join him in prayer. In such an emergency, God must not be left out of the account. God must be appealed to for deliverance from these blasphemous enemies of God and his people. Just at this particular junction, the forces of the king of Assyria, which were besieging Hezekiah, were diverted with an immediate attack on Jerusalem. 
the king of Assyria, however, sent to Hezekiah a defaming and blasphemous letter. For the second time, as he is insulted and beset by the forces of this heathen king, he enters the house of the Lord, the, quote, house of prayer, unquote. Where else should he go? And to whom should he appeal but unto the God of Israel? Quote, and Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, O Lord of hosts, host the God of Israel, that dwelleth among, between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And note the speedy answer and the marvelous results of such praying by, that, by this God-fearing king. First, Isaiah gives the king full assurance that he need fear nothing. God has heard the prayer and would give a great deliverance. Then, secondly, the angel of the Lord came with swift wings and smote 185,000 Assyrians. The king was vindicated, God was honored, and the people of God were saved. The united prayers of the praying king and the praying prophet were almighty forces in bringing deliverance and destroying God's enemies. Armies lay at their mercy, defenseless, and angels, swift-winged and armed, with almighty power and vengeance, were their allies. Hezekiah had ministered in prayer in destroying idolatry and in reforming his kingdom. In meeting his enemies, prayer had been his chief weapon. He now comes to try its efficiency against the set and declared purposes of Almighty God. Will it avail in this new field of action? Let us see. Hezekiah was very sick, and God sent his own familiar friend and wise counselor and prophet, Isaiah, to warn him of his approaching end, and to tell him to arrange all his affairs for his final departure. This is the scriptural statement. Quote, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thou saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Unquote. The decree came direct from God that he should die. What can set aside or reverse that divine decree of heaven? Hezekiah had never been in a condition so insuperable with a decree so direct and definite from God. Can prayer change the purposes of God? Can prayer snatch from the jaws of death one who has been decreed to die? Can prayer save a man with an incurable sickness? These were the questions with which his faith now had to deal. But his faith did not seem to pause one moment. His faith is not staggered one minute at the sudden and definite news conveyed to him by the Lord's prophet. No such questions which modern unbelief or disbelief would rise are started in his mind. At once he gives himself to prayer. Immediately, without delay, he applies to God, who issues the edict. To whom else could he go? Cannot God change his own purposes if he chooses? Note what Hezekiah did in this emergency, sorely pressed, and see the gracious results. Quote, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Unquote. It was no self-righteous plea which he offered to God for a recovery. He was only pleading his fidelity, just as Christ did in after years. Quote, Father, I have glorified thee on earth, unquote. He is the Lord's reminder and is putting him in mind as to his sincerity, fidelity, and service, which was in every way legitimate. This prayer was directly in line with that of David in Psalms 26, verse 1. Quote, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, unquote. This is not a prayer test with Hezekiah, nor is it a faith cure, but it is a testing of God. It must be God's cure if a cure comes at all. Hezekiah had hardly finished his prayer, and Isaiah was just about to go home when God gave him another message for Hezekiah, this time one more pleasant and encouraging. The mighty force of prayer had affected God and had changed his edict and reversed him in his purpose concerning Hezekiah. What is that which prayer cannot do? What is it which a praying man cannot accomplish through prayer? Quote, and it came to pass before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court 
that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal him. On the third day thou shalt go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for David, my servant's sake. Unquote. The prayer was to God. It was that God should reconsider and change his mind. Doubtless, Isaiah returned to his house with a lighter heart than he did when he delivered his original message. God had been prayed to by the sick king and had been asked to revoke his decree, and God had condescended to grant the request. God sometimes changes his mind. He has a right to do so. The reasons for him to change his mind are strong reasons. His servant Hezekiah wants it done. Hezekiah had been a dutiful servant and had done much for God. Truth, perfection, and goodness have been the elements of Hezekiah's service and the rule of his life. Hezekiah's tears and prayer are in the way of God's executing his decree to take away the life of his servant. Prayer and tears are mighty things with God. They are to him much more <clears throat> than consistency and much more to him and decrees. Quote, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. Unquote. Sickness dies before prayer. Health comes in answer to prayer. God answered more than Hezekiah asked for. Hezekiah prayed only for his life, and God gave him life, and in addition promised him protection and security from his enemies. But Isaiah had something to do with the recovery of his praying king. There was something more than prayer in it. Isaiah's praying was changed into the skill of the physician. Quote, and Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Unquote. God often uses remedies in answering prayer. It frequently takes a stronger faith to rise above means and not to trust in them than it does to wholly reject all means. Here was a simple remedy that all might know that it did not cure the deadly disease, and only a means to aid or to test faith. But still more praying was to be done. Isaiah and Hezekiah could not do things without much praying. Quote, and Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or go back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backwards ten degrees. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backwards, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Hezekiah meets the occasion and covers the answer to his prayer with thanksgiving. The fragrancy of the sweet spices are there, and the melody of the harp also. Four things let us ever keep in mind. God hears prayer. God heeds prayer. God answers prayer. And God delivers by prayer. These things cannot be too often repeated. Prayer breaks all bars, dissolves all chains, opens all prisons, and widens all straits by which God's saints have been held. Life was sweet to Hezekiah, and he desired to live. And what can bear God's decree? Nothing but the energy of faith. Hezekiah's heart was broken under the strain, and its waters flowed and added force and volume to his praying. He pleaded with great strivings and with strong arguments, and God heard Hezekiah's praying, saw his tears, and changed his mind. And Hezekiah lived to praise God and to be an example of the power of mighty praying. Like Hezekiah, the decent way of praying without soul did not suit Paul. He puts himself in the attitude of a wrestler and charges his brethren to join him in the agony of a great conflict. Quote, Brethren, I beseech you, unquote, he says, quote, For the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, 
and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, unquote. He was too much in earnest to touch the praying business gentilly or with gloved hands. He was in it as in an agony, and he desired his brethren to be his partakers in this conflict and wrestling of his soul. Ephesus was doing the same kind of praying for the Colossians, quote, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, unquote, and end worth agonizing for always. This kind of praying by these early pastors of the Apostolic Church was one secret of the purity, one source of the power of the Church, and this was the kind of praying which was done by Hezekiah. Here was prayer, born in the fire of a great desire, and pursued through the deepest agony of conflict and opposition to success. Our spiritual cravings are not strong enough to give life to the mightiest conflicts of prayer. They are not absorbing enough to stop business, arrest worldly pursuits, awaken us before day, and send us to the closet, to solitude, and to God, to conquer every opposing force, and win our victories through the very jaws of hell. We want preachers and men and women who can illustrate the uses, the forces, the blessings, and the utmost limits of prayer. Isaiah laments that there was no one who stirred himself up to take hold of God. Much praying was done, but it was too easy, indifferent, complacent. There were no mighty movements of the soul towards God, no array of all the sanctified energies to reach out and grapple God and draw out his treasures for spiritual uses. Forceless prayers have no power to overcome difficulties, no power to win marked results or gain a complete and wonderful victory.